Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. So nice to be talking with you all again today. My name is Professor Steve Razy. I'm a professor of physics at the University of Windsor in beautiful Windsor, Ontario, Canada. It is great to be talking with you again. Uh, we're here for one of our fabulous DOD STEM K-12 Saturdays, Virtual Great Lakes Region and Tribal Nations Open STEM Learning Sessions. It's fantastic that you're joining us. This is the uh, freezing moon, November, November, November edition of our STEM learning session. And because it's November this month, we are acknowledging Native American Indian Heritage Month, Veterans Day, and Thanksgiving. So fantastic that you're able to join us. We're gonna have a wonderful session today. We're gonna hear about a lot of interesting things. And today I'm gonna to be talking about something that I find particularly interesting. It's gonna occur up in the sky above us. And many of you uh, may have witnessed this phenomenon, but then again, many of you may have not. And I was inspired uh, to give this talk, as you'll see later on in the presentation um, by a news report that I actually saw. I'm very lucky to be living here in Canada and this phenomena could be quite common in the northern parts of Canada. So let's just see what it is exactly that I'm talking about. That's right, it's going to be the northern lights. So obviously I'm talking to you from the north. Um, the northern lights seems like a topic that we could all be interested in. So um, I'm gonna be talking about what are the northern lights and where do they come from? And I have this beautiful image on the screen uh, that you're seeing behind my title there, this dancing magic light up in the sky. In this particular case, these beautiful, fantastic green lights that just make you look up and really wonder, what are these dancing lights? Where do they come from? And if we are lucky today, we're gonna to get a really good answer to both of those questions. So let's see if we can try to figure out those two things, okay? So first off, uh, as I said, I'm talking to you from Canada and the University of Windsor, which is down here in the southwestern part of Ontario, we sit on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy, the First Nations. This includes the Ojibwa, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. We all of us at the University of Windsor respect the long-standing relationship with the First Nations people in this place, in this 100-mile Windsor-Essex Peninsula and the Straits or Les Détroits of Detroit. And we're glad that you're able to share this experience with us as well. So I am very, very grateful to Mr. James Vukulich and his YouTube channel, which is the Ojibwa Word of the Day. Um, so I think it's really important that we actually try to maybe learn some of the new uh, language that we can use to describe this phenomena. And so uh, Mr. Vukulich has this fantastic site where every day on YouTube, you can just go and listen to him um, say a new word of the day. So I want to talk about the Northern Lights. So let us find out and learn what the Ojibwa word uh, for the Northern Lights is. I'm gonna play this and you should be able to hear it on your computer. So let's just see. Wawate. Wawate. See if you can repeat after him. Wawate. Wawate. So the Northern Lights, Wawate. I, I love that word, uh, something that's gonna stick with me for a, a long, long time. So today we will be talking about Wawate. So here is another beautiful video of the Northern Lights. And you know what, I'm gonna have a lot of embedded videos in this presentation. Uh, still pictures of the Northern Lights don't really do it justice. You get these beautiful colors on the screen for sure, but it's not just the colors of the Northern Lights, it's the dancing and the movement, kind of starting on the Northern edge of the sky always and shooting down towards the South, this magnificent movement in the sky. And of course the colors themselves are magnificent. We will talk about that today as well. We're seeing greens here, we're seeing purple, bright green here, this is almost yellow down here. This almost looks blue in the middle, red down here, some violets there. Here's a bright orange kind of red, but green here and dancing yellows, red over here. This is almost a purple in this side right there. So the Northern Lights, lots of movement, lots of different colors. What are these? Where are they coming from? So let's dig into that a little bit. So we've just learned that of course, these are sometimes called the Northern Lights. That's what I uh, was calling them when I was a small child in Northern Wisconsin. And we've just learned now that they're also called Wawate. What other names do you know this phenomenon by? Go ahead and post your answer in the chat there. Let's see if anybody knows this. 
Yeah, that's right. The Aurora Borealis. Exactly right. So if you at home uh, watching us in YouTube now are thinking, oh, I know that it's the Aurora Borealis. Absolutely right. The Aurora Borealis. And sometimes if we're being lazy, we just call them the Aurora. Oh, I hear the Aurora are going to be wonderful tonight. But the Aurora Borealis is the full name. Here's another question for all, you all at home. Post this in the chat if you know it. What language is that? Aurora Borealis. What language would you think that would be? Not English. Yes, based on Latin. Exactly right. Exactly right. This is kind of coming from Latin. In 1619, the Italian astronomer and physicist Galileo Galilei coined the term Aurora Borealis. So that phrase, that name is that old. Where did that come from? Well, Aurora was the name for the goddess of the dawn, according to the Romans, uh, known as Eos. And uh, Aurora usually described as rosy fingered by the Greeks, while Boreas was the god of the north wind. So Galileo, who observed these phenomena, was combining the name of the goddess of the dawn and the god of the north wind. So you put those two together and what do you get? Aurora Borealis, the lights of the northern hemisphere, which we've seen, literally means dawn of the north, which of course makes sense because it always occurs in the northern part of the sky. And sometimes it looks like dawn is coming. It can be so bright. Whoa, you would think that the sun is coming up, but it's not. It's these dancing lights always in the northern part of the sky, the Aurora Borealis. So thanks to Galileo for that. Where do you have to see, uh, where do you have to be or live to see the aurora? Um, most people in their life have never had the good fortune to see the aurora. I'm fortunate, uh, I have uh, several times in my life, but certainly wherever you are right now watching this video from, it's entirely possible you live in a place where you're never gonna see the Northern Lights. So if we look at this kind of a northernmost shot of the planet Earth, we're looking down on the North Pole right there, you can see this zone right here. It's this kind of ovular region, which we call the auroral zone uh, right here. And you can see that it kind of circles around the North Pole, but it extends moderately far south. But in this uh, view graph right here, you note that it's cutting off right on the edge of the Northern United States. So we're all right here now in Detroit and Southern Ontario right there. We would be outside of that zone. On very rare occasions, it will dip down even uh, more southerly than that. But you really need to live in the northern part of the United States. And of course, the further north you are, say in Canada, then the much better chance you have of seeing the aurora. But certainly if you live near the equator, the southern United States, you're almost certainly never going to get to see the aurora. You also need to live in a pretty dark spot. So you might live in a big city up in the north, like Calgary or Edmonton, something like that. But if you're surrounded by very, very bright street lights and you look up, you're not going to be able to see these. So you need to live in the north and you need to be able to get outside where it's quite dark and have a clear view up to the northern horizon. But those of you who are probably at home uh, looking at the, the slide uh, on the right side of the screen, you're probably realizing that's not the only place you need to be to see the lights because this is a view of the South Pole. So it turns out there is also an equivalent version of the Northern Lights down at the South Pole. What do you think we call those? If you're thinking the Southern Lights, yeah, you'd be right. The Southern Lights are also called the Aurora Australis, right? So the Southern Lights, which is dawn of the South as well. So that makes sense. So again, there's not as much land down near the South Pole. So there's not a whole lot of countries out there where you can actually go to see the Southern Lights, as opposed to in the Northern Hemisphere, where at least there is some um, of the continent there where you can be on. So this is mostly this auroral zone, mostly over uh, the oceans at the Southern part of the Earth. But the Northern Lights and the Southern Lights, both visible near the poles, the North Pole and the South Pole. But was anybody else thinking this when I asked, where can you see them from? How about from space? Absolutely, right? If you were ever lucky enough to be on a spacecraft, maybe on the International Space Station, you could have this amazing view of the Northern Lights looking down from space where you can get an unprecedented view of this hundreds of kilometers of dancing light above the surface of the Earth. And that would be an absolutely amazing view. And this is a picture taken from the International Space Station of the Northern Lights above the planet Earth. So that's where you have to be to see them. What are they? Let's dig into this. What exactly is the aurora? Well, this picture kind of illustrates it all. I'm gonna break this down, uh, each one of these little bits of this picture to give you a really good understanding, but it has to do with radiation coming from the sun. It's ejected from the sun and comes flying towards the earth. And instead of slamming into the earth, it's going to wrap around the earth. And that's going to be the phenomenon that's going to lead to the Northern Lights. 
So this radiation, charged particles, things coming from the sun, these would be like electrons, which are subatomic charged particles, and other heavier charged particles get ejected by the sun. They gain a lot of energy when they're ejected by the sun, and they head for Earth at speeds up to 45 million miles per hour. So that's really, really fast. And they come screaming towards the Earth, but they don't slam into us down on the surface of the Earth, and we're very, very lucky for that. They collide with our atmosphere in a layer of the atmosphere called the magnetosphere. And when they interact with the magnetosphere, which is going to have to do with the magnetic field generated by the Earth, these energy, the electrons and other charged particles interact with that magnetic field and they get accelerated. They get accelerated, um, but not straight down towards the surface. They get bent and curved around and accelerated toward the polar regions. And you can see that bending here. So this magnetic field is kind of creating a shield, a bubble of magnetic field around the Earth that these charged particles just cannot penetrate. They can't penetrate straight through, but they get bent out of the way. And as they get bent out of the way, they start spinning and they're all going to spiral into the north and south poles of our planet where the magnetic field is actually piercing in at both of the poles. And um, so all those charged particles are going to have a strong impact up in the northern and southern poles where the magnetic field of the Earth is piercing in and out of the Earth. And when they do that, then those highly energetic charged particles are going to collide with the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is just a uh, large cloud of gas which surrounds our Earth, made up of mostly nitrogen and oxygen. So when those charged particles run into impact the nitrogen and oxygen molecules, that's going to give rise to the aurora. All right. In those collisions where the molecules are just kind of floating around and in come those screaming electrons at what, 45 million miles an hour, they slam into the molecules electrons and they transfer a lot of their energy uh, to those molecules. And the molecules get really energetic and excited from the impact of the charged particles. And when they get de-excited or lose their energy, these molecules, they're going to release it in the form of light. And this is exactly similar to how a neon light works. So I've got this open 24 hour sign. You guys have all seen neon lights um, driving around the town. There's bright red or green lights and windows like I'm showing here. All that is, is a tube of gas and you're accelerating electrons across the tube of gas. And as those electrons in that tube of gas are striking all of the neon molecules, most likely in that chamber, the, the neon molecules get excited and then they give off light. And that's exactly what a neon light is doing. And that's really what the aurora is. It's not contained in a gas, uh, a small glass tube. It's just up in the atmosphere, which is why the lights extend over dozens or hundreds of kilometers and are dancing continually. But there are molecules up there and they are constantly being impacted by this uh, heavy stream of charged particles from the sun. And that's what's going to give rise to those phenomena. And now that we know that it's the impact of molecules, now we can actually start to define what are the colors of the aurora and why are they different? Why, are, why, why were there reds and pinks and blues and greens? Well, that color, if you're carefully looking at it, if you remember the video we saw before, the color can tell you which molecule is giving off the light and they can also tell you what altitude that impact is probably occurring. So those beautiful dancing red auroras we saw are coming from excited oxygen molecules very high up in the atmosphere above 200 kilometers. The blue auroras are not oxygen at all, they're nitrogen molecules, but they're a little lower than the red. So nitrogen being excited 100 to two kilometers up. The green aurora is again oxygen. It's a different type of excitation of oxygen. And that's again, lower than the reds at around 100 to 200 kilometers. And then these pink auroras, which we didn't see quite so much of, were actually again, excited nitrogen molecules, but at the lowest altitude, below 100 kilometers in our atmosphere. So when you see all those different colors, you're actually looking up through the atmosphere at a lot of different altitudes. Of course, we can't tell that from the ground, um, but this is what physics kind of does for you. It can start to give you information about what's happening in the atmosphere, which is really, really cool. So now let's talk about why does the sun do that? Why does the sun emit all this radiation? Well, it's emitting, it's emitting uh, charged particles all the time in something we call the solar wind. And I'll show that in a little bit. So there's always a flux of charged energetic particles from the sun called the solar wind. But in a couple different events, it emits 
all kinds of radiation at once. And one of these really cool phenomena are called solar flares. So I'm, I'm showing video here on the left and on the right. So this is the same view. Obviously, you can't see any of this from Earth, right? The sun is, we can't even look at the sun on Earth, of course. But when we do, it's just a small yellow dot. These are NASA images from a satellite that's carefully observing the sun. And if you look up here, you see these beautiful images. Now here, look at that's a solar flare right there. You can see that the surface of the sun is not uniform at all. It's a very violent place. Um, you can see these little regions here. So these are called like sunspots. And look at these, it looks like explosions of the surface of the sun. And that's kind of what it is. This is releasing a tremendous amount of energy and charged particles come flying out. This is a side view of the sun. This thing right here, this is the exact same phenomena as what's going on here. We're just looking at a different view of it. So this is looking at it from the side. You can see how high above the surface of the sun that stuff's emitting. And then they should look right down on it, boom. And if that looks like an explosion of stuff coming out of the sun at you, it really is. The sun is blowing bits of the surface off and ejecting that stuff out into space. Where does it go when it comes out into space? It goes everywhere. But if it happens to be coming right at Earth, it's going to impact the Earth. And when it impacts the Earth, it's going to interact with that magnetic field, strike the atmosphere, and create the northern lights. So those are called solar flares. There's another even more violent form of expulsion uh, of materials from the surface of the sun. And these are called coronal mass ejections. So what I'm showing here is, again, another NASA image of a coronal mass ejection, whereas the solar flare is kind of a shooting out of material. The mass ejections, you can see they're usually much more spread out, and it really is a violent ejection of matter from the surface of the Earth. Much more material is released in a coronal mass ejection uh, than in a solar flare. So watch the come here. And you can see that it's the whole surface of the sun blowing out into the solar system. And on the right, what they're showing here is a computer simulation uh, of what such an event would be. So you notice some minor events being released in the moments leading up to boom, this huge coronal mass ejection right there. And so this is kind of a scale of the images of the sun. Here's planet Mercury, planet Venus, planet Earth. And you can see how much material actually gets ejected out into the solar system. Look how small Earth is compared to this wave of material that gets shot through the solar system. So here on planet Earth, there's no avoiding that when that stuff comes at us. And we're very thankful for our magnetic field, which provides us this protection. So let's talk about that magnetic field. Why is it that we're protected? The sun all the time, as you can see in this picture, is always kind of ejecting stuff out. It streams out in every direction from the sun. And here's this planet Earth. And I love this. This is just a beautiful picture here that I've got here. This Earth's magnetic field, you can see it, it just really creates a bubble of protection around us. So you can think of all these charged particles and this radiation coming from the sun and, it's sun and it's streaming from left to right. And instead of being able to smack into the Earth, there's this bubble of magnetic protection, which kind of wraps all the uh, radiation and charged particles around it. And yes, some of that radiation spirals into the poles, but instead of slamming into the surface of the Earth, we are protected. And this is just a beautiful picture, which gets that across. And over here, I love this animation because it shows the much more dynamic nature of the solar wind. So this really gives you the, the impression it's coming from left to right. There really is a wind. Now, it's not like the wind that blows outside where you feel it on your face. The solar wind is this wind of energetic charged particles that are really there and it comes flying through space. And you can see it on the right there that instead of being able to, to hit the surface of the earth, there's this bubble that responds to that field and kind of where it wraps the charged particles around us. So this kind of looks like a boat cutting through the water uh, with a shock wave out in front of it. Well, this is the wave of the charged particles impacting our magnetic field and then wrapping around, impacting our magnetic field and wrapping around. This is a computer simulation. You can see some high intensity right at the poles, right? So these white things are what are called magnetic field lines. And right at the poles is where the field lines are kind of disappearing into the Earth. And so that's why you see intense bits of color in that picture at the poles. That would be the one place on Earth where those charged particles can hit the atmosphere. And that's where the northern lights and southern lights come from. So the Earth's magnetic field, as I said, we're very thankful for it. It's a bubble of protection around us. Why does Earth have a magnetic field? It is not true that all planets in our solar system have a magnetic field. Well, uh, we believe that the Earth's magnetic field is created by what's called a geodynamo. So the geodynamo is caused by a rotating liquid core, all right? So this is uh, what the structure of Earth's interior looks like. Here's the surface of the Earth. Uh, at the very center of our planet is a solid inner core which is rotating. Around the solid inner core is a molten liquid outer core, which is also trying to rotate around that. And around that is 
the, this, this mantle, the, the, the mantle and the silicate base crust. So then the whole point of these cores, there's a lot of metals in it and metals are conducting. So metallic things can conduct electricity. And when electricity and things that conduct rotate, then they can generate magnetic fields. It's a very complicated process. But again, this is a well-known process in physics. So if you were to try to model what's happening in our core, there's this inner core, there's this outer core. The whole thing is kind of sloshing around and it's metallic and conducting. And as it sloshes around, it generates its own magnetic field. That's what we mean by a geodynamo. So the dynamo is the generation of the magnetic field. Geo is because it's related to the geology of our planet. Uh, and so as long as the Earth is spinning and this liquid and solid core are spinning inside, generating these very, very strong currents, it generates this magnetic field and emanating from the North and South Poles, because of course the Earth is rotating around the North and South Poles. So that kind of makes sense. And again, so we're very, very lucky to have this magnetic field because as I said, not every planet has one. In fact, Mars has no such protection at all. Um, now it is believed that Mars does have a liquid core. So this is you know, a, a, an example of what the center of Mars might look like with this liquid core. And it's got this a solid mantle around it. And of course, Mars does rotate, but it just does not generate uh, its own magnetic field. All right. Uh, recent simulations, what I'm showing here on the right, these are some calculations by uh, you know, a geophysicist and astrophysicist who say that uh, there is a magnetic field on Mars. So if you could take an instrument that measures magnetic field on Mars, you, you would uh, actually measure something. It has what they're calling an induced magnetosphere. So the induced magnetosphere means that actually the kind of rotation along with the actual arrival of the solar wind, the solar wind itself, these charged particles as they wrap around generate a magnetic field. And they have this wonderful simulation on the right, which the example they gave is it, it, it really does look as if someone took a plate of spaghetti and threw it on someone's face. And then all those spaghetti strands wrap around your face. So these are magnetic field lines that wrap around Mars. Uh, and so there is this induced magnetic field but it has no global magnetic field on its own. Our earth has a magnetic field and if the sun wasn't there, it would still be generating its magnetic field. The, the residual magnetic field on Mars is due to the arrival of charged particles from, from the sun, so it's induced. And that's really, really important for the survival of life on earth. Because Mars has no such protection, it's pretty much so a sterilized or dead world because our understanding of the biology says that no life can exist in this constant flux of very deadly solar radiation. So it turns out that outer space is a really, really dangerous place, not just because it's cold and there's no oxygen to breathe, but there is an intense flux of radiation away from the sun. And they worry about that a lot. Astronauts uh, on the trips to the moon, which are not too long, but staying on the International Space Station are not protected from that radiation. We we're protected down here on the surface of the Earth. We're protected by our atmosphere, which protects us from a lot of that radiation coming in. We're protected by the ozone layer, which protects a lot of the ultraviolet radiation from coming through. And we're protected by our magnetic field, which stops the charged particles from coming through. People on the space station have none of those things. So it's a really dangerous place. And you, you can't stay up there for too long of a time without starting to accumulate an appreciable dose. So Mars has nothing like that. And uh, as, as a result, there is really expected by all um, people who are investigating planetary science that there should be no life on the surface of Mars. Now, may, maybe buried underneath the surface somewhere away from that flux of radiation. Sure, maybe potentially we'll look. But on the surface, that's what I mean by it's sterilized by a constant flux of really deadly radiation. And, you know, and the lack of magnetic field probably caused the loss of a lot of its atmosphere uh, as, as well. So, um, you know, again, we're really lucky to have a geodynamo that, that creates this zone of protection for us. So I think this is really important. You know, let's, let's think about this. So when you think about the Northern Lights, again, if you're ever lucky enough to see these beautiful colors now, you've learned where they're coming from. But let me just tie this together now that you know where it comes from. This is, you know, really imp important, uh, especially, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about how the physics that we know on our planet uh, relates to the other cultures that we have. Uh, because this is a ubiquitous phenomena and it 
the Northern Lights have been around on Earth as long as humans have been around, many or probably most cultural groups in the Northern or Southern parts of our planets have legends about these lights. How could you not? Uh, anyone would look up and wonder where these things come from. So for example, in medieval times, uh, of course, the occurrences of rural displays were always thought to be harbingers of war or famine, which means it's a, it's a bad omen. It's an omen that something evil is gonna happen. Uh, the Maori in New Zealand shared a belief with many Northern people of Europe and North America, the lights were reflections from torches or campfires, because you might think, oh, it's something way over the horizon. I'm, I'm just not seeing it. Um, the Menominee, indigenous people of Wisconsin, so this is actually where I'm from in Northern Wisconsin, uh, believed that the lights indicated the location of these Menabaiwak, I hope I pronounced that right, the giants who were the spirits of great hunters and fishermen. If I got any of this wrong, I do apologize. This is uh, coming from the Northern Lights Center, Watson Lake Yukon Territory, is where I'm pulling this information from. Uh, they believe these are the, the spirits of great hunters and fishermen. So there's great great cultural significance to these lights. Uh, the Inuit of Alaska believe the lights were the spirits, the animals they hunted, the seals, the salmon, the deers, the beluga whales, very, you know, it's, it's a part of nature. Other indigenous peoples believe the lights were the spirits of their people, the ancestors. Uh, and in fact, this is where I got the idea from this talk from. So I would really, if people want to know more about this, I would really encourage you just to Google this story. Um, this is a story. So if you if you go on Google, look for something from CTV News. So CTV News is a news channel in Canada. And I was watching the news one night and I saw this wonderful interview uh, from uh, Jolie Big Eagle Big Eagle uh, Kekoatue, she's Nakota Cree, and she was talking about what she was taught at a young age about the sacred lights. And it, it really uh, impressed me a lot. I'm very thankful for her for sharing that story uh, and, and what um, the beliefs are in these lights and how important they are to the, these other cultures. Um, so I really would encourage people, if you wanna know anything more about that, do a little research on your own and, and find out what the other beliefs, um, maybe from cultures all over the world, think about this amazing phenomenon. So this is what I want you to think about. With We've seen from the science that without the protection that our magnetosphere provides us, and that's causing the northern lights, there would almost certainly be no life on Earth. Okay, we would not be here. We would be like Mars, a sterile dead planet if we didn't have this magnetic, the magnetosphere, the magnetic field which protects us, and the northern lights are a consequence of that protective shield which the Earth itself has generated to protect us. So we owe our existence and the existence of all of human history to these lights. These lights are the indicators that the earth is protecting us. So in a way, they certainly are our ancestors. We would have no ancestry. We would have no past if we did not have these Northern Lights. So when people say these are the spirits of our ancestors up there, they are, they really are. We owe our life. We owe our very existence to these lights. And of course, they represent our future as well, because humanity would have no future on this planet if we were not protected by um, this wonderful gift of the geodynamo that the Earth has provided us, which then we are witnessing as these northern lights. All right. So think about that when you guys get to look at those northern lights sometime. Uh, I think if you ever get a chance to see it, you're gonna be absolutely amazed. I have no doubt about that. But having listened to this presentation, I hope now it'll just mean just a little bit more to you. It makes you again think one of the wonderful things about science is the more you learn about science, honestly, it makes you realize how small uh, humans really are. Science is an amazing tool to understand the universe around us, but it's a humbling tool because it makes you realize that the universe is so vast and so magical and humans are such a small, limited part of it that it's amazing we can actually begin to appreciate and understand any little bit of it. And it just starts by attending these STEM K-12 Saturdays, just like you're doing now. You don't have to know everything about everything. Just know a little something about one thing. Let your curiosity guide you. That's going to go a long way in your life and maybe lead you one day to being a great scientist. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation today. I appreciated your time talking with me, and I look forward to talking with you again in December. All right. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.